Hello, hello. If everybody can please make their way in, we're about to get started. Thank you. No matter how loud I scream, like people. I know, it's really good. Yeah. I love it. It's like <laughs> social, real life social hour here. How many of you guys can do this? I'm just. I think I just want to do Repository of talks. It's good, yeah. And they're all, all the videos are up on the uh, media. Check out everyone behind. It's really good. I'm going to check out yours first. <laughs> what did you talk about? Uh, Bitcoin. 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 Bitcoin
So, Sasha Manga. Um, I'm very proud to introduce Sasha Manga. He, when he graduated from Waterloo a few years ago, he moved to San Francisco to work for Facebook, where he's done, we're doing growth and product marketing. He's now come back to Toronto to work on the platform partnerships, where he's helping both social platforms and social brands kind of make themselves better and more apt to having users use them. So he's really just here to share all those secrets with you. So, Sasha Manga. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thanks all of you for choosing to spend your, uh, what is it, Wednesday evening with me instead of the World Cup, which I know is going on and really exciting too. So I, I'm, I'm uh, flattered that I'm more interesting than Cameroon versus Croatia. <laughs> if it gets boring, you can ask Scott to switch it maybe. Um, now that you're all well hydrated and, and socialized, uh, I, I guess I'll start. Um, so I work on the platform team at Facebook, uh, as Scott mentioned, um, and how, the way we think about platform is there's this like, connective tissue that exists in the world now that didn't exist about 10 years ago. And this connective tissue is sort of like a directory of every person on the planet who wants to be a part of it, and their real identities, and they're connected with the real people and places and things that they care about, sharing meaningful stories and, and, and meaningful information. And this thing exists now where sort of 10 years ago, we had the internet and we had lots of information on it, information like uh, stock ticker prices and what the weather was and what the score to the World Cup games were. Um, but this whole sort of connective tissue that was predominantly composed of people, this information existed, but it just existed in the ether and it wasn't useful and now it is. And on top of this connective tissue, Facebook's been able to build uh, a few really interesting products. So we have things like Messenger, where I can just see a list of all my friends, tap on somebody's face, and we can have a conversation. Or things like Newsfeed, where at the end of the day, I can open up my phone and I can see all of the highlights of things that happened in my world, the people that I care about, the things that I care about. Um, but where I get really excited is this connective tissue should be useful for way more than just Messenger and Newsfeed and Timeline and groups and things that Facebook's going to build. This connective tissue should make pretty much any experience better because it can be personalized for you and because your friends are more accessible. And that's not going to be built by Facebook. It's going to be built by you guys. It's going to be built by the partners that I get the chance to work with. It's going to be built by little startups, built by huge established brands. Um, every experience in the, in the world should be made better because of this connective tissue. So this is like a trend, like a wave that's happening right now in the world, where things are getting more personal, things are getting more social, things are getting better um, because of this sort of connect connective tissue that didn't exist 10 years ago. And um, so it kind of begs the question, like, okay, what do we do? Like, what should I do about this thing? Um, I sort of think of this as like a, a recipe, where if you can understand kind of what this means, you can come up with uh, a couple of like really clear uh, principles um, and understanding these principles will help you really take advantage of it. So it's like a school of thought that I would call social design. Um, and we didn't invent social design. We didn't, I don't know if we were the first ones to even use those words. Um, social design is, is really, really simple and it's been happening for uh, literally thousands of years and, and it has like two pieces to it. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. The first piece of social design is to have a really solid understanding of, let me go to that slide. Sorry, social design. The first piece of social design is to have a really solid understanding of how people work. Why do we talk? Why do we communicate? How do we feel about ourselves? How do we feel about other people? Um, this is like the fundamental thing that everything gets built on. Facebook didn't invent behavior. We enabled behavior. We, we made things easier. We made things better. But we didn't invent anything. Once you understand natural social behavior, then you can start to come up with ways in which you can amplify and extend this with technology. That's the principle. Those are like, that's like the recipe. It's part one, part two. So you notice part one, there's no mention of technology. There's no mention of, of apps and social media and social networks. Um, part two, we kind of touch upon that. Um, but it really just starts with people. Does anyone know who this guy is? He's from Toronto. He's one of my favorite Torontonians. There you go, McLuhan. So Marshall McLuhan said many really, really smart things. Um, one of my favorite was he had this, this sort of theory that all media is just extensions of man. Everything we build, um, every tool we create, every space we create just extend the things we do naturally, right? So even things like my clothing is an extension of my skin. 
Um, my glasses are an extension of my eyes. Um, you can start to see how this plays out in things like, um, like phones are extension of, of my voice. Everything we build just looks at the things we do naturally and extends it. That's exact. He said this probably 50 or 60 years ago now, but this is exactly um, what is relevant right now in a world where we have this connective tissue and we're actually making things more open and connected. That is like the number one piece of advice is that all the things we build just extend the things we do naturally. So I'm gonna split my talk up into two parts. First, I'm gonna talk about people, some fundamental human truths, some fundamental principles about how we behave, how we operate, human nature, and you'll notice that none of these things should seem like huge surprises. Um, these aren't things that should seem super controversial. These things should actually seem pretty obvious in retrospect. Um, human nature is kind of like the straight arrow that doesn't really change meaningfully in somebody's lifetime. This changes on the order of millennia. Technology obviously changes very, very rapidly, but the why we do things doesn't really change, even if the how does. So, that is still important to understand. I would argue that this is way more important than understanding that, because if you understand this, you'll be relevant forever. If you just understand technology, you might be relevant and, and, and knowledgeable for a small period of time, but then that'll just continue to change. This is like the fundamental platform upon which everything, uh, er, upon which, uh, everything gets built on. So the first half will be talking about sort of fundamental human truths, and then we'll talk about a few trends in technology that relate to these things that are happening right now that I, I see as being important to kind of internalize and, and take advantage of. So four things. So I won't pretend that these are the four things. If you understand these four things, you understand people. I don't, no one will fully understand people. Um, sociologists and anthropologists and, uh, and people dedicate their lives to understanding this. This is kind of my attempt at like an 80-20, where I think these four principles, if you really understand them, will set you up really, really well to build good social products. So let's start. Let's start with the basics. Why do we even communicate? Like, why do we talk? We spent quite a bit of time at Facebook trying to answer this question because it is sort of the basis to why people use Facebook. Um, we obviously have a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of information that exists outside of Facebook. We have a whole team of sociologists and anthropologists that study this stuff um, and try and come up with patterns that we can look at and then try and build towards. Um, I'm gonna talk about three, three major patterns around why we communicate. First one, utility. We communicate to help ourselves and we communicate to help other people. This was a post I made uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, a friend of mine recently joined Airbnb and was hiring for a couple of, of positions. And I shared this with my network on Facebook and I got a bunch of likes and comments and that felt nice. But more importantly, I had like 12 people message me and I got um, in, in my inbox that they were interested in these roles. I was able to send Aaron a bunch of leads and he hired one of them. And that's like a fundamental, like primal, human satisfaction of being able to help a friend, help two friends actually, um, and, and is really not even a human thing at all. This is like an animal thing. Animals communicate to help each other and, and they chirp or they, or they signal honeybees will tell other honeybees where the honey is or where the nectar is, I guess. They know where the honey is. Um, but this isn't even a human thing. This is like a fundamental animal instinct. Super important. Second, we talk to craft our identities. Anyone know Mabode from Rap Genius? Okay, a couple people. So this guy is, uh, he was the founder of Rap Genius. He recently left the company after some controversy. Um, this guy's like a total character. Everything, you can see what he says here, like, what if there was a thing like Soylent, except instead of eating it, you sniff it, and instead of giving you all your nutrients, it makes you want to dance and party. And you look at that, there's clearly no utility to that statement, right? But, but Mabode has this like persona, and if you meet him, or if you hear him, if you, if you watch in any interview with him, there's a really good one you should watch on, on TechCrunch TV, I think. Uh, and this guy will like come into an interview and he's wearing sunglasses and he's got like a crazy outfit and he looks like he's in like a boy band or something. And he's talking on like a really deep level about social technology and he's super brilliant. But he has this identity about himself of like a crazy like Steve Jobs-esque maniac entrepreneur and everything he says, if you look at his Twitter, his Facebook kind of goes towards that identity. It's, a, it's a very, another very fundamental reason why we communicate is to craft identities. He's got one of the more interesting identities. Okay, third, we talk to build relationships. You see this all the time, people will, like why do we check in with people on Facebook? Or why do we like each other's stuff? These little positive feedback loops, these really lightweight interactions that um, are actually what create relationships are just little, little things that get built up over time. So if you think of what a relationship is, 
It's just a sum of all of your shared experiences and shared interests. And they're not going to be like, you're not going to go from meeting somebody at a party to being the best man at their wedding. Um, you'll, you'll do lots of little things. You'll hang out, you'll get dinner, you'll do all sorts of little things. You'll like each other's stuff on Facebook. Like I have friends in, in California where uh, we have a lot of shared interests and when we, when we see each other we have a great time, but I just don't see them that often. And almost our, our whole relationship now it might just be liking each other's stuff. And it sounds really trivial, but it is a really interesting outlet for building a relationship with somebody over a long period of time. And we see this happening a ton on Facebook and happening a ton on all sorts of uh, social spaces. Okay, let's talk about identity. Second most important thing. Identity is multifaceted. You may not have heard this from us like two years ago, um, but I think we came to recognize this and I think it's a really good thing that the world is recognizing this. If you can look at the internet, uh, I kind of think about three phases. In the first phase, everything was anonymous. There was no identity. I was a different person wherever I went. Maybe some people would use the same handle or, or whatever, but for the most part, identity was absent from the internet. And that, that informed a lot of how we used the internet. And then Facebook came along and all of a sudden there's a billion people using it and they're using their real identity and they have this one identity that they use and it's useful for a lot of things. But it's not really like the be all and end all of, of the internet because if you go back to natural social behavior and extensions of man, people actually have very different identities. I have a different identity with my girlfriend than I do with my parents than I do with my coworkers or with my university friends or with all of you who some of whom I've met some of whom I haven't met identity is such a multifaceted thing and it's such a difficult thing to understand that there's going to be all sorts of spaces that get built up some by Facebook and many by not Facebook that cater to different elements of people's identities as I'm using this app secret it's sort of taking the world by storm yeah I, I love secret it's, it's such a fascinating space um, it's interesting, the one piece of identity that they use, so for those of you who don't know, don't know Secret, it's kind of like an anonymous-ish, uh, anonymous, anonymous um, network where you can post something and it's usually like things you probably wouldn't say to all of your Facebook friends and your name is not attached to it, but your location is. That's the one piece of identity that they use. And it creates these really interesting like network-based, um, like an, an, uh, or a location-based network to, uh, in, in some regards where if you read something like this guy saying, I wish I was as popular on OkCupid as I am on LinkedIn. It's kind of like a pompous statement. And when you see that he's from San Francisco, that adds this total different flavor to the, the statement than if he was from Toronto. That's the one piece of identity they use and it creates this really interesting environment. You look at something like Instagram, like this is not my real life. I don't do all these cool things every day. Instagram is my curated highlights. It's, it's the identity I kind of want to portray to the world for whatever reason. Um, Con, the festival is happening in France right now. Kanye West was on a panel with Ben Horowitz a couple of days ago. It was super fascinating. I don't know if any of you guys saw this, but Kanye West has the most liked photo on Instagram of all time. It's him and Kim Kardashian at their wedding, and they're kissing in front of this massive like floral wall that he actually designed himself. And he's talking about Instagram, and he has this amazing line, and he's like, do you know how long it took me to make that photo? It took me four days before that photo was good enough to post on Instagram. And now it's the most liked photo on Instagram. And it took him, Kanye West four days to do this. Like it just shows you that here's a network that there's incredible photography and it's a very specific slice of people's identity. And then you have things like Pinterest where people are making pin boards for, like this is my places I want to surf. People have pin boards for stuff I want to do in my home. Recipes I want to cook. It's aspirational identity, the way many people use it. And that's another really incredible and an incredibly important piece of your identity. So the new internet, five, the next five, ten years, will look a lot more like this. I kind of think of the, there's these three waves that are really important to, to look at. Because this is how real life works, right? People have lots of different facets to their identity. It's not just anonymous and it's not just one. Okay, so we talked about why we talk. Um, let's talk a little bit about the environments that help us say certain things. Audience informs what we say. What we say depends on who's listening. If you were to open your phone right now and look at your camera roll, those are all of the things that you wanted to share with yourself. And there's a lot of things probably. I probably take a dozen pictures every day and they exist just in my camera roll and probably no one will ever see them except for me. But that's a lot of content. The further you get away from yourself, the more filters you have to apply because now what you're saying has to be consistent with the identity, the facet of your identity that you've portrayed to that whole group. So the things I might say to my university friends are very different than the things I might say to my friends at work. The things I might say to my girlfriend are different than the things I might say to my mom. 
the things that we, uh, let, let, let me give you like a, a very real life example. Let's say I'm in Cannes right now and I'm at, I'm at the south of France and I have a lot of colleagues who are there and posting stuff on, on, our, on, on newsfeed and it's driving a lot of other people kind of nuts. Um, but let's say I'm at this really fancy restaurant and I'm at having the best meal of my life and I take a picture of it. Maybe I don't want to share that with all my friends on Facebook. Because it doesn't seem like a, a, a nice thing to do and I don't want to really feel like a show off. Um, but if somebody was coming to Cannes next year and they were in that same neighborhood and they were looking for a good place to eat, I would love to share that with them. So the context matters a lot. So you can kind of think of audience in like four broad spheres. There's all of my friends. And the things you might say to all of your friends are kind of going to be a very filtered, um, there are going to be a lot of filters applied to what you will say to all your friends. Then there's friends in context where I'm comfortable sharing this photo with anybody who's going to come to France. And then there's specific friends like, I uh, found this really great uh, restaurant and I know you love restaurants and I'm gonna share it with these, these people that I know love restaurants. And then there's yourself and that's like everything. So if you're designing any social space, it's really important to understand who, well, what, what kind of content you're helping people share and then design the audience around that. We, we try and uh, provide people a lot of control around the audience uh, that they're sharing to because it, it'll generate a lot more content. Uh, but there will be tons of space for individual networks to just focus on one of these spheres and build really, really incredible stuff. The value of sharing. This is a really important rule for why we share. The amount of stuff we share with any given party is totally proportional to the value we think we're going to get from that. So 15, 20 years ago, you wouldn't put your real address on the internet because it seemed like a dangerous thing to do. But now if you don't put your real address on the internet, you won't be able to buy anything on Amazon. 10 years ago, you didn't put your real name on the internet. I remember when I first signed up for Facebook and my dad was like, you can't do that. I'm like, why? He's like, because it's dangerous. The perceived costs, even if they weren't really real, outweighed the, benef the perceived benefits we would get out of that. But now if you didn't use your real name on the internet, you can connect with your real friends and, and have real conversations. This, will, this, this is like an arrow that will continue to go up over time, and it's not a bad thing for the world if people share more information. It's only bad if we don't get value in doing that. If I walked into a restaurant and they greeted me by name and they said, hey, Sachin, um, we know you're a vegetarian. Here's our vegetarian specials. Um, there's nothing there with sesame seeds because you're allergic to sesame seeds. Um, have a seat by the window. We know you like window seats, and we got your favorite drink coming for you in two seconds. That might seem, if you, if you were to describe that to somebody, that might seem like a totally crazy and, and kind of uh, weird thing, but it's actually a great experience. Over time, things will get more personalized, but um, only in proportion to how, much, how, how comfortable we feel in sharing this information. So if you're building anything that sort of pushes the boundary of this, of this arrow, and it happens a lot, like we do this often too, we'll launch things that uh, might just be a little, bit, a little bit too high on this line, and it will kind of come back down, and over time, this line kind of moves upwards and companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon startups are kind of responsible for, for pushing this line forwards. Um, and it's just something to be cognizant of. Like, where am I on this line? Okay, so that was people. Let's talk a little bit about technology now. We talked about why we talk and, and those reasons don't change over time. Like, those reasons are static. The how will change very, very rapidly. Here's a few trends that I'm noticing in, in how we talk that are really interesting to keep track of. We use pictures and videos instead of words now. And again, this sounds kind of crazy if you were to describe this to somebody five, 10 years ago, uh, but we have cameras in our pockets wherever we go. Um, the reason we invented words in the first place was that it was a better way to describe a situation or a feeling or an expression than whatever we were doing before we had words, which was like grunting and flailing our arms wildly. Pictures and videos are probably, in many cases, better than words, just like words were better than whatever came before that, and just like something else will come up uh, in the future that is better than pictures and videos, until we get to a point where we can like beam our thoughts and feelings to each other. Um, when we launched stickers on Messenger, I thought it was the dumbest thing we could possibly do. Uh, I remember thinking, like, this is so trivial, this is so stupid. Um, it's the biggest surprise I've ever had since working at Facebook around a product launch. I find I have conversations now that are entirely um, based on stickers. And it's actually not even that bad of a thing. Like, you can, like, the, 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 the old uh, adage is true, like, a, a picture or a sticker says a thousand words. Um, 
this is actually just a natural evolution where now that we have access to um, image uh, access to cameras and we can transfer images instantly and for free across the world, um, words might be obsolete. If anyone has read um, Super Sad True Love Story, has anyone read that book? It's an awesome sci-fi book that kind of explores a world where uh, we don't use words anymore. And, and it actually doesn't seem that far off. Lightweight and simple sharing. This app made headlines today. Uh, anyone recognize this? Yo. It's, that's what it's called. It's called Yo. Yo just raised a million dollars today. Yo was built in eight hours. Yo doesn't have an interface besides that, that screen. So I, I open the screen and I see a list of people that I've added, so I have to add a username. And I tap one of their names, and then they get a, a notification like that that just says, yo. <laughs> so I don't know if this is totally insane or totally brilliant. Probably a little bit of both. But if you think about it, this makes total sense within the construct of um, amplifying natural behavior and extensions of man, and, and, and we crave connectedness. And this is removing all of the friction to having, helping me connect with a friend. Somebody asked um, the founder, like, why, don't, why can't you just use WhatsApp or something and, and like, type yo? And that sounds like a reasonable question. And I loved his answer. If I was to use WhatsApp to type yo, that would take me 11 taps. When I use yo to type yo, it takes me two taps. <laughs> but that's like more than five times better. Like this could be more than five times more useful for a very specific use case and a very specific type of, uh, of sharing. But I generally think the future is trending more towards things like this. And it's a really fascinating thing to watch. If anyone wants to send me yo's, I think I got the username Suchin. I'm very proud of it. Oh, my phone's going to like. Um, OK, so another really interesting uh, way that we're talking now that didn't really exist a little while ago. Objective-based networks. We have general social networks. We have the Facebooks and, and, and Twitters of the world that are helping people accomplish a huge, vast amount of sharing. Um, but we have also networks like Nike Plus or Foursquare's new Swarm that take advantage of, of one of two things. So Nike Plus is like an identity-based network. It's for people who are runners, and they connect with other people who are, are maybe their friends or maybe not their friends who also like to run, and they can find trails to run together, and they can do whatever runners do. I don't run, clearly, so I don't, I don't I know a lot about this topic, but, um, but it's, it's super fascinating. And you have things like, like Swarm, where the only thing I have in common with those people might be that I'm here right now, and I want to like grab a bite to eat later. And tomorrow, we'll have nothing in common. It's not like running. If you're a runner, that's part of your identity. Being here right now and, and wanting to hang out with someone later isn't really part of my identity. It's a need-based thing. It's a contextual-based thing. But if you go back to the fundamental reasons why we share, like this is a super utilitarian thing. And Nike is a really interesting way to help people craft their identity and build relationships. And there's a bit of utility around there too. So if you can extend those things and understanding why people talk and think of how do I remove all of the friction in helping people accomplish what they want to do? The future will probably look a little bit more like objective-based social networks, super lightweight, simple sharing, and whatever the best medium is to accomplish what I'm trying to say, and that'll probably not be words and alphabets 10, 15, 100 years from now. Another super interesting phenomenon, we're approaching a world of perfect information. So in game theory, there's two types of games. There are games of perfect information and games of imperfect information. Chess is like a game of perfect information because you have everything you need to know in order to make a decision. I can see the board, you can see the board. We're, we're, uh, I'm, I might not be very good at chess, but I can, be infinitely, I can be infinitely good. Poker is a game of imperfect information. I can see my cards, I can see the cards that are on the table, but I don't know what you have or what you have or what you have, um, so I have to make an educated guess. The interesting thing... <laughs> I'm glad this is resonating with you guys. <laughs> the, the interesting thing with perfect information is that there's only a really small percentage of the, if you think of any decision you need to make and all the information that could help you make that decision, only a very small percentage of it is like static things with absolute answers like what is the weather right now? What is, did the market go up or did it go down? What was the score in the World Cup game? These are things that the internet has been good at for a very long time. but when you think of any decision you need to make, most of the information that will help you make that decision doesn't just exist in, like, on weather.com. 
it exists in the connective tissue that people create. It's information about people, it's opinions, it's information about your friends. It's things that used to be in the ether and were really not useful and now exist on platforms that have APIs and you can access and become really, really useful. So very quickly, all of these problems become obsolete. All of these decisions, they're not, they don't get made for me, but I have all of the information I need, to, uh, I need in order to make a decision like what shoes to buy or who I should date or is this a good idea? Will she like that gift? These are all soluble problems. We just never really had the information at our disposal to make these decisions in a more meaningful way. Another really interesting trend. We're sort of realizing that most things still happen offline. So if you think of the three stages similar to um, around identity, we went from a world where everything was offline to a world where we tried to get everything online to a world where we're realizing that some things actually just will be offline, they'll be augmented with the connective tissue, but, and some subset will be, will be online, right? If you and I wanted to have a conversation and we weren't in the same room, we, we would need the internet. Um, but for the most part, most of the things we want to do are still offline. So there's this huge opportunity to use the connective tissue to make offline experiences better. This is one of my favorite examples because it is super important. Um, it's an uh, entrepreneur in India created this thing called social blood where you log in with Facebook, it pulls your location and your list of friends, and then you tell it what blood type you are and whether you're looking for blood, like you need blood, or you're looking to donate blood. And very quickly it connects you with people who have the same blood type as you, who live close by, and it's saved like literally millions of lives. So this is clearly something that's gonna happen offline. Like we're not gonna ever gonna be able to donate blood via the internet. Um, but the internet should help. And there's a thousand more things like this. Even things like Airbnb that we might not consider as like online or offline in, in any way. Like I, I, if I'm traveling to a place and I need a place to crash, um, clearly that is happening in the real world. But clearly the connective tissue should make that better, right? This is something that couldn't exist if it wasn't for connective tissue. If I, five years from now, if I was to say, hey, I'm gonna go to this new city I've never been to, I'm gonna stay with a total random stranger, that would seem like a really, really bad idea. But in a world where information uh, about people can travel faster than the people themselves, this can be like a very viable option and, and maybe even um, not only cheaper, but maybe even more rewarding than staying in a hotel where, um, where in an Airbnb's case, if I wanna travel to San Francisco and I could see that I have 11 mutual friends with this person and I can talk to them and ask them about him and, and, and they might say, oh yeah, you know, like you guys both love to surf and you both love uh, indie music so maybe he can show you the good surf spots and take you to a show and um, this becomes a much more meaningful and rewarding way to travel than just staying in a hotel. So it's still happening offline but connective tissue is augmenting it. This is happening in every industry. I was, I was in a discussion recently with um, Canadian Tire. They own Sportcheck too. And they were talking about, okay, well, what does the future look like? Like, what's gonna, what should we do offline? What should we do online? Um, and they're making, they're, they're doing such incredible things in the offline world too. They're realizing that uh, e-commerce isn't just gonna destroy everything. Everything will either happen online or be augmented um, by, by the internet, but then still happen offline. So they have flagship stores now. It's, there's, a, there's a sport check near Young and Eglinton where if you, you walk in there and it's like, let's say October and you wanna buy a winter coat. You can try in a winter coat. You can step inside a freezer and then you can see how it feels or you can try on boots and you can stand on this inclined icy ramp and you can see how they hold up. So these are things that the internet's not gonna replace. But maybe you just walk out while wearing the, the boots and, 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 the, and the coat and the connective tissue knows your, your identity and your, your payment information and you don't need to pull out your credit card and the experience is augmented via the internet but it's still happening offline. So there's like countless startups doing this obviously right now. I don't need to list them to you guys, but this seems to be a really, really interesting, um, if you think of like Marshall McLuhan and extensions of man and, and amplifying natural behavior, all of our natural behavior was offline for the entirety of human history until very, very recently. And that's still, I think, where the bulk of the opportunity lies. This is one um, uh, that's, I hesitated to put this in here because I'm not 100% sure yet if it's like a real trend or not. But I, I think this is gonna happen. The other ones are all kind of like, okay, yeah, those are happening. Um, this one is, I don't know, you guys tell me if you think this makes sense. So throughout human history, our friend groups were pretty predefined. If I wanted to do something, I was limited to who my friends were. If I wanted to go out for dinner with somebody, it was like, okay, well, who are my friends? Okay, let's go for dinner. Your, your friend groups were never really that well defined. Like nobody knew that, okay, here's a list of all my friends. 
Uh, and, that, and they changed over time too, right? When you were born, your best friends were your parents. And then your siblings and cousins, and then the people you, you went to school with or lived in your village, and then people you worked with or people that you sh shared similar interests with. And, um, and it, it changed over time. So now let's apply like the Marshall McLuhan extensions of man and, and extending natural behavior and think about, okay, what does that look like in a world of connective tissue? I think that will get accelerated to a crazy amount where instead of just slowly changing over the course of your life, it changes over the course of a day. Like, what are the chances that if I wanted to have dinner tonight, um, what are the chances that the best person for me to have dinner with is a, is a friend that I already have? Like, it's not zero, because friendships matter and relationships hold weight, but it's not 100. Maybe there's somebody who, maybe I'm, I'm struggling with a problem at work around JavaScript, and there's somebody in the city who is like the best guy at JavaScript, but he's struggling with some other problem around like social design, and, and maybe I can help him, and he can help me, and, and maybe I'm here, and he's there, and there's a restaurant here that has a reservation available, and we can meet, in the, we can meet, we can meet halfway, and we would have an awesome night. Um, and the only reason that can't exist right now is because information is just in the ether, and it's not really part of the connective tissue yet. The reason why I'm bullish on this is because it's starting to happen a little bit in industries like dating that are always sort of operated in, on the fringes of like predefined social groups, right? Um, in, inherently, if you think of dating by nature, you're kind of looking for partners outside, uh, slow, s s sort of outside of your, your predefined friend groups. Um, and with like Tinder, you can land in a new city, you can open it up, and now you have this whole group of people that you might want to connect with. Um, but the connective tissue is really helping make this happen, right? You might see you have mutual friends and mutual interests, um, and now you're, you're doing this thing. But generally, your total addressable market for who to interact with will go from like 100 to 200 friends to eventually everybody in the world that has the internet, and eventually everybody in the world. Because it's just extending things that are, it's extending the phenomenon that already existed, which is our friend groups are, were never really that well defined. They just had to be because information can travel very fast and we can travel very fast. But in a world where we can travel really fast and information can travel even faster, that whole concept might just go away. So the key takeaway here is that those technology trends are interesting right now, but if I were to do this talk again five years from now, maybe Yo is like a $10 billion company and like this seems really obvious and, and, and the trends are totally different and if you focus a lot on these things, that would probably not be a good idea. If you focus on the red slides around how humans operate, how we feel about ourselves, what human nature has uh, created over millions and millions of years, that will all still be relevant five, ten, hundred, 10, 100, 1,000 years from now. Start with people, understand what people are trying to do naturally, and then think of, okay, well, given the technology that exists right now, how can I build stuff to amplify that and make their lives better and help them achieve real outcomes? The best technology will just fade in the background, F fade away in, into the background, and you won't even realize that it's technology. And this happens already, right? Like, there's th things we use right now that we don't even think of as technology because they just faded away, and, and it's just our natural behavior. That will happen a lot more. And the, and the number one question to ask yourself, no matter what you're building, is how can this be made better in a world with connective tissue? Information about people that just existed in the ether five years from now it doesn't anymore, and it'll increasingly, um, in the connective tissue will increasingly get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more important and more important, and there'll be more APIs that you can read to and write to, and connective tissue will make everything better. So think of what you're doing and try and think, how could this be made better in a world with connective tissue? Thanks a lot. Um, I can, if anyone has questions, um, I, I'll stick around up here. Anyone? Anyone want to send me? Okay, cool. Where'd you go surfing in Portugal? <laughs> I, well, no, that, that was my aspirational identity. I haven't. I aspire to surf in Portugal. Um, no, it was actually Spain. There's a place called San Sebastian that I would love to go to one day. Um, but yeah, I haven't done it yet. Anyone have a real question? <laughs> I'm just <joking. laughs> Sorry, what was that? Did you really like psych courses? No. Uh, well, I did psych 101, but uh, actually most of the stuff isn't really like, if I were to go back to school, I probably would want to study s sociology and, and, and maybe urban planning, because I think 
Um, urban planning, if you think about it, is actually the original like social network and social media design, right? Um, people were building physical spaces to help people interact with each other long before we were building virtual software spaces to help people interact with each other. So if you want to really get good at social product design, I would encourage you to read up guys like William White, who studied how people interact in a courtyard, or Christopher Alexander, who studied um, what makes a building useful. Um, so that and, and, and then social psychology, like I won't pretend to really know that much about this. This is kind of things that I, I gather from Facebook and from meeting lots of really good entrepreneurs that are building good social products. Um, I generally find that I'm surprised more, um, I'm surprised there isn't more sort of human nature, social psychology um, content in like technical degrees and, and product design and, and engineering because Unless you're building things that are being used by robots and computers, this is just as important. So I would have liked to do done more, but I, I didn't really. Does Facebook offer any API for social cases to build things that plug into Facebook? Totally, yeah. So um, yeah, I, sorry, yeah. So the question was, does Facebook build anything, any APIs that can help people plug in to, to Facebook? Um, so we have a whole set of APIs. The, the, the biggest one is just the graph API. And if you think of most things that you do on Facebook, um, those can be done via the API. So read and write. So the API can, can look at your, 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 uh, your timeline and see all the photos you've taken and, and where, you, your, where your current location is and favorite movies and whatever and build things around that. Um, a lot of content that, that exists on Facebook is actually coming from the API, coming from apps like Instagram and Foursquare and Nike Plus uh, and Spotify and RDO. Like my entire music section of my identity on Facebook is written by RDO. Um, there, there's a bunch of different examples like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what programs does Facebook have um, for companies that build on top of the API? So we actually don't have a ton of formal programs because almost all of our APIs are just public. Um, so most things that get built on top of Facebook, like you don't even, even need to talk to us um, uh, in order to build things. We have a program for people building uh, B2B software on top of our API. So this is called the Preferred Marketing Developers Group. There's a handful of PMDs in, in Canada. Uh, in Toronto, there's Ad Parlor down the street, uh, another company called B Notions in St. Lawrence Market. Um, and these are generally people that are building apps for other businesses or building uh, tools to help, people buy in, uh, to help people buy ads on Facebook. Um, that's really the only formal program we have uh, around our, our, our APIs. But generally, um, we do a lot of other like informal kind of one-off things. We do roadshows around the world. We do hackathons. Um, we try and meet as many startups as we possibly can. But the number of people building on our APIs compared to the number of people we have on the platform team is just like astronomical. Um, so we actually don't have a ton of formal things besides the PMD program. So I'm a B2B app. So what, yep. what would I do in order to Cool. So check out. Um, I don't know the exact URL, but if you just search Facebook Preferred Marketing Developers, you'll get to a portal. And there's a few different uh, categories, uh, categories of, of, um, of companies. There's apps, ads, pages, and insights are the, the four broad ones. Um, and yeah, and also, I don't know where my clicker is, but um, feel free to email me too, and that goes um, for everybody. If you're building something cool with the connective tissue or building something like a B2B app, um, let me know. And, uh, but yeah, you should be able to find all the information you want uh, online. Yeah? Some, some applications seem to get more love than others. I'm not sure if that's because of what they're doing or because of scale. Like Pinterest uh, has a preference as far as notifications, as far as saying messages for users. Uh, who who all have that love? Yeah, that's a good question. And in what circumstances? Yeah. I think, um, yeah. yeah, so the, the question is, does Facebook give more love to, to different apps? And I'm guessing that means in like distribution and, and things like that, access. or access to things, yeah, access to APIs. And if so, what are the circumstances around that? If you think of the early days of Facebook platform, we had like the first thing was like Farmville. Um, and, and Zynga was building all these games. Um, that was a good lesson in the type of content. In, in the type of content people like to share is not necessarily the same as the type of content people like to see in their feeds. And so we continue to tweak the newsfeed algorithm to try and kind of map those two things together. Um, 
So Zynga is a good example. Like Farmville got probably way more distribution in newsfeed in the early days than they, than Farmville would now. Like now, um, if you don't play any games on Facebook, you generally probably won't see any stories in your newsfeed about games. Um, this is like a great thing for people. Um, so our newsfeed algorithm and 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 so outside of the access to APIs, the newsfeed algorithm is just constantly changing over time to try and come up with the optimal set of stories that people might want to engage with. In terms of access to APIs, we actually have very few closed APIs now. This, there was a time where we had a lot more. Right now, the only API that I can, as far as I can tell, that is closed is the ads API um, because of just the amount of power you have if you can write ads to Facebook uh, and the messages API for sort of similar reasons because it's such a sacred channel. Um, Pinterest and, and Instagram, like even Instagram, like no one would have access to APIs that other people don't have now. Um, and generally all of our APIs will be open and openly documented. And in terms of distribution, um, I don't think we really give preferential treatment to individual developers, but we do change the distribution for different types of content based on all sorts of different signals. So like the games example is one, but like I love um, seeing stories about music and my friends listening to music and I post a lot of stories from RDO and Spotify and, and I will, there's probably a whole set of people that will see a lot more stories from Spotify and RDO than others. Um, I think largely it's, it's very variable. So, so if you make API available Yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah. I would say for 99% of, of of time, unless there's some crazy exception, like ads, you can imagine, is a very different circumstance set of circumstances. Messages is the same, but um, the notifications API, for example, is all, all games have access to it, and no one that's not a game has access to it right now. Um, so generally, we try and follow kind of broad rules. Yeah. I'm kind of curious about what's happened behind the scenes on the platform team over the past okay. four or five years, because yeah. I've you know, I worked on Facebook apps a long time yeah. ago when it was unstable and things were changing all the time uh, and there was a lot of cursing and it's yeah. been a lot better the past. Now that's good to hear. So, so I'm yeah. That. I'm curious about what's been changing. Okay, so what's changed on the platform team in the last four years? Well. Uh, that's definitely one of them, a much bigger focus on stability. Um, we have like a 90-day breaking change policy. We have like a two-year core API policy now. Um, it, it was just, it was, all, it was never one of those things where it was like, oh yeah, like screw those developers, like we're gonna break this API all the time. It was always more of a question around, like we didn't have that many resources and there was always this astronomical um, divide between the number of people building stuff on our platform and the number of users using them um, and the number of people we had to actually manage these APIs and that, that, that definitely changed. Uh, I think broadly the, the, um, the biggest themes have been trying to align incentives between people and developers. Um, the Zynga example is a really good one, right? It was awesome for Zynga that they were getting all of this great distribution, but there was a whole set of people that didn't want to see these stories. So a lot of what we're trying to do now has been around, and if you saw what we launched at F8 recently, it's giving people more control around the information that they share with apps and what they see in their news feed. Um, that's become probably as equal of a, of an, uh, like people are as equal of a stakeholder now as, um, as developers, which I think definitely shifted a lot of stuff towards like kind of a stability and, and, and um, kind of not trying to break things all the time mindset, if that answers your question at all. Yeah, at the back. What technology and or online trying to be most excited about? I'm most excited about right Yeah, I, I'm really excited about that last one. Uh, I think it has the, so that was the concept that, and if everyone heard the question, it was what, uh, what online, or what trend are you, are you most excited about right now? The last one is interesting because I think it has, um, when I talk about like, Natural behavior doesn't really change, but technology kind of changes the way we do things. This is one where technology will really, really change the way we do things. Um, like, what would happen in a world where your total addressable market, like if you think of like in business terms, you have, if I had a coffee shop on, on the corner of the street, my total addressable market is the people who are in this neighborhood. Um, your total addressable market for people to interact with is really, really small, especially offline but there's no reason why it shouldn't be everyone in the world. And I think that'll just have massive changes that I can't even predict around like how we do everything in our lives. And we're starting to see inklings of this right now, um, but it's, it's the one that I'm most excited about because I think I can predict it the least. Yeah, totally. Um, and again, because I don't think the behavior is actually different. 
So they use Facebook to do things, and they use phones to do things, and they use rooms like this to do things, and they generally are trying to accomplish the same things. Uh, we have a really big research team. Um, I don't know, I haven't worked at other companies in our space, so I don't know if it's like comparable to like a Google or a Twitter or something, uh, but we have a very, very big research team, and these are generally people who come from psychology and sociology background and, and not like an engineering background, and they travel the world and they talk to people and they ask them how they feel about things. There was one really interesting um, experiment that I'll share. Um, people, we had a team that went around to different countries in the world, and they gave them a blank canvas, and they said, um, show us your identity. I think they probably used a more eloquent word than that, but it was like, um, here's this canvas, it's yours, show us who you, what you're all about. And when you, did, when you do this in like a wealthy, upper middle class American uh, society, the things that you get on this board are the things you can imagine, it's like the things that all of our friends probably post on Facebook. It's like, here's my new car. I just graduated from this university. I just had a kid. I'm at this really cool restaurant. It's like things I've done. And when you go to like a favela in Sao Paulo, it's this is the school I'm gonna send my kid to. Like this is the house I'm gonna live in. And aspirational identity becomes a huge, huge component of what it means to be that person. Um, so that was one that really st stuck with me. And, and it kind of goes to the identity is multifaceted and, it ch and generally I think it, it, like that's an example of how we're kind of different, but for the most part, the, the, the learnings we get are that we're generally the same. Um, but we, we do a lot of offline research and it's usually things like that, where like we literally just went with like a, a canvas board and we asked people to show us what it meant to be them. Yeah. I think we got time for one more and I'll go, go to you, yeah. So, I like the idea that everything's connected and that like a cell phone is an extension of voice. Maybe like the internet is an extension of your mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you really put all your thoughts into what's on. And how far does this extend? Do you see this? Do you see there being a limit of the, when things get too far? Let's say, let's say you know how you, how you have a reservation that you know like you have an allergy to sesame and you like you're a vegetarian. Can they eventually extend this to, to, to a point where they can predict who, who a criminal is? Like you know, there's a there's a belief that probably yeah. is it yeah. about like you know they're they're you're thinking about doing a crime and they arrest you for doing that. Yeah. You think eventually you might get too far to the point where that might happen? Yeah, it's something I think about. Um, I don't. I don't know like what too far is. I think you can paint a, like a very dystopian future where like this has clearly gone too far, and then you can paint a future where we just didn't get far enough, and and we're still living in a world where people die of allergies because they went to the restaurant and, and they, there was sesame oil and they didn't know, and it's like okay, clearly this was preventable. Um, I don't think there's a good answer on what the happy medium is, but I will say the important thing for us to do is to a hold um whoever is the harbinger of this data like i don't like facebook's interesting because this is all people own this data you have access to everything you can download all the information you can delete all your stuff we're kind of like the custodians Wh whichever entities are the custodians of this data and that's companies like facebook and companies like google and amazon as well as governments the most important thing we can do is to keep these players accountable for um for for what they're doing um keep them transparent. Um, we're pretty big proponents of this. Like, good, better privacy standards is just better for Facebook. Um, it means we can provide a more valuable service to people. Um, there was a really good debate, a monk debate. Uh, I don't know if you guys, any of you know the, these monk debate series. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, about a month or two ago, and it was Alexis Ohanian, who is the founder of Reddit, um, debating the guy who used to be the head of the CIA. And it was on state surveillance. And obviously, Alexis Ohanian was arguing against state surveillance, and um, the, the CIA guy was arguing for. Um, Alexis Ohanian ended up winning the debate, uh, and they each had a partner too. But it was like, if, if anyone wants to like, kind of understand this, like, that was just a fascinating subject to debate on, because both, like, there's no clear answer, right? Um, I mean, I generally think I would take the Alexis Ohanian side uh, around this, but the argument for state surveillance was like, oh, we'll protect you guys. Um, so it's, it's, there's a difference between ideas and execution, and it's not clear to me what the answer is, but the most important thing we can do is keep governments and keep companies um, accountable. And I think that will just be good for the world. Cool. Well, it uh, looks like we're, we're wrapping up, but I'll, I'll, I'll be around for about 15 minutes if anyone wants to talk. Thanks again. All right. Thanks a lot, Sasha. Let's give him another round.
That's okay. Um, don't worry about it. We'll see what we can do. We did it. Awesome. So yeah, we're hiring. So if you guys want to talk to someone from Achievers wearing a purple lanyard, you're more than welcome to, or just go to achievers.com slash careers. And one last thing, if you want to get in touch with us, we're always available at uh, Achievers Tech on Twitter, Facebook, and email. So thank you very, very much for coming. Stick around, have a few more drinks, and socialize. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.